decades. For example, the collapse of the oil industry, the rebound of casinos after COVID. If elected, when you leave office in four or eight years, what path would we be on? An all the above path. The truth is an economy that is strong and growing in the South has to meet every person where they are. So whether your skill set is blue collar or white collar or low tech or high tech, Louisiana has to have a job available to you. And so we can't pick winners and losers and we can't be old energy or new energy. We have to be a little bit of everything to everyone. That's why it's so important to revamp our workforce development, train kids for all the jobs of today and to make sure we're there. Now to have a business climate that brings in those new jobs, we have to make sure that we have low taxes, low regulations, an, an economy that attracts investment. Because what we're seeing around the country is businesses, individuals, families are moving to those states that are attractive for a strong business climate. If we make some of those tweaks, make some of those changes, we can provide great opportunity, not just for the families we have here at home, but also attract new families, new individuals from other states. And we got to start growing because we've been shrinking for far too long here in Louisiana. All right, Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Dominique, for that question. You know, in eight years after a Wilson administration, you will see an economy bustling, growing in the areas of manufacturing, in the areas of clean energy, building on our natural assets here in the state of Louisiana, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's uh, the people of Louisiana, or a better and more improved education system. You will see a community and a state that's just humming along uh, and getting along as a state. We will have higher wages. We will have better health outcomes for our people. We will have addressed the issues of crime, and we will have companies coming to Louisiana wanting to make investments and building here. We'll also have an opportunity for young people who are graduating from college or starting their own business will be prospering in the state of Louisiana, attracting citizens to this state, growing businesses in a large scale plan. And that is what we will see in my administration. Finally, I will tell you, you will see an administration that's been making responsible decisions for our future, one that we will continue on that trajectory to grow, trajectory to grow far beyond Across the state of Louisiana, you have to think that these are things that had we done these uh, changes and made some of these opportunities available to us in the past, it would have happened already or we'd already be on that path. And you have to acknowledge the fact that we're making investments in infrastructure across like broadband is a major investment opportunity. Investing in workforce training is a major opportunity to get on that path to grow. And so I don't think that we've missed the boat. I think we're at the precipice of that opportunity. All right, Mr. Mr. Wagaspak, you headed lobby, the, you know, many of those, those large companies, how, how do we offset the, the dis disadvantage that American companies in general face? I'm glad you asked the question because I dispute the premise behind it. Look, internationally, they have weaker environmental standards than we do here in America. They have weaker child labor laws and employee protections than we do here in America. That is a badge of honor, not something we have to weaken. And also, the second thing is, if you look around the country in the post-COVID era, businesses, manufacturers, companies are moving south. They are moving to states that have a receptive business climate and can provide a qualified workforce. And all they're looking for is a workforce that can read and write and stay off drugs and have good soft skills. If we can provide those people in a good climate for them to invest, we can grow manufacturing even more than we are so today. And we're seeing it right now in Louisiana with new clean energy investments, carbon capture investments, blue hydrogen investments. We're already beginning to grow. We can take it to the next level. And not only we not weaken, environmental standards and employee protection laws, but I think we can even strengthen them over time. Right. Um, I'm told by our production truck that we lost the signal um, just briefly. So, Dana, if you would tell me uh, if someone needs... So, so we're going to start that over again. Let me, let me just... The, re the question was... Um, it actually, um, if, if you want to read the question just one more time, Dominique. The question is, 
Our poll showed economy and jobs remain the top concerns with voters as they have been for decades. Uh, for example, the collapse of the oil industry, uh, the rebound of the casinos after COVID. If elected, when you leave office in four or eight years, what path would we be on? We will be on an all, above, all of the above path when it comes to our economy. It is our duty to provide an economy that has opportunities for everyone. I'm sick and tired of seeing our best and brightest, our young generation, leave for states like Texas to go find jobs. And when they leave for Texas, they're not leaving just for energy jobs or just for high tech jobs. There's a whole universe of jobs available there. So it's our duty to provide those opportunities here in Louisiana. So I don't care if it's white collar or blue collar or low tech or high tech, we have to provide those opportunities here. And the key is workforce development, training kids for the jobs of tomorrow. It's also creating a business climate where people want to grow and invest here in Louisiana. That means we have to reduce our tax burden. We have to reduce our regulatory burden. We have to clean up our legal environment so people feel safe in investing their hard-earned investment here in Louisiana. So if we can provide that opportunity, we can create jobs for everyone here in Louisiana so we don't have to pick and choose. We can provide options for everyone no matter where they start and where they want to finish. All right, Mr. Wilson. In eight years after Wilson administration, we'll have an economy that's just humming along and growing. One that folks want to come to Louisiana, an opportunity for us to have better wages for our citizens. And that will allow us to have a better health care system, a better educational system, and one that folks are feeling safe in their communities, in their homes. We have an opportunity before us to invest in the types of jobs that are going to be here for the next generation, whether it's renewable in the world of solar or hydrogen. All of these are opportunities for us to grow and build an economy that we can all be proud of and one that will cause people to come to Louisiana. We'll have an innovation economy where people are investing in themselves, growing businesses to hire their friends and neighbors and graduates of our vocational schools and our technical schools and our universities. And folks will have an opportunity to enjoy the quality of life that's so unique here. We will be very proud of where we are. We will have made our state much safer, much smarter, much healthier, and of course much wealthier. And working together, we will have toned down some of the partisanship and the divisiveness that occurs to work together as a state. All right, uh, my apologies at home if uh, that was some of that was repeated but I wanted to make sure we had everybody's answer. Let's get our next question from Greg Merriweather. Good evening, gentlemen. Um, as we sit here in New Orleans tonight, there's a great deal of families out there that are watching this that just do not feel as safe as they once did. Uh, we've heard that sentiment from people all across the state. It's a simple question, but maybe a tough answer. How did we get here, and how do we get out of it? Well, Greg, that's an easy question. I think you have to acknowledge the fact that the chief law enforcement officer of the state who was responsible for helping lead that effort in the state of Louisiana is absent. He's been absent from the job and he's absent here tonight. The first law of leadership is actually showing up. I think there's some other factors as well, whether it's dealing with crises of mental health, whether it's dealing with uh, the lack of an economy in terms of jobs, even though we have the lowest unemployment in the state's history. The idea that communities have to own these issues and have to make the investments that will ensure that citizens have a, have a feeling of success, that they have a feeling of safety. And that deals with paying officers. It deals with making sure we have technology and tools that are out there to ensure our police officers at the state police, at the sheriff's department, and local levels are all working together. In my administration as governor, I will be a partner with local governments. I will be a partner with communities to make sure that we work collectively to deal with these issues and not single out any one community. Because an unsafe community in Louisiana is still in Louisiana, and we have an obligation to protect all of our citizens. Mr. Ragersbeck. The crime epidemic is a major concern across the state, urban, rural alike. And there's lots of factors. One, the breakdown of the family unit is one issue there. We need people, quite frankly, to be more authoritative and more involved parents. That's one thing to solve some of these juvenile crime issues. Another piece is we have to find more police officers. With the rise in inflationary wages, quite frankly, they're going to other jobs that pay better and are less dangerous. We have to pay police, train them, and back them up when they risk their lives to keep us safe. We also have to double down on investing in technology body cams, license plate readers, street side cams for neighborhoods that are in high crime or high tourism areas. We have to prove cases so people don't have to testify against their safety. The last thing is we have a juvenile epidemic in this state. Besides better parenting, we have to create regional juvenile facilities that we can take these juvenile offenders off the streets and put them in a place where yes, they are detained off the streets, but also retrained, given a GED, drug treatment, whatever they need so they can hopefully get back, stop that cycle of crime and become the types of citizens we expect and hope that they will one day be. The, the next governor, gentlemen, is likely to uh, encounter a bill on his desk that would roll back some of Governor Edwards' reforms that um, were designed to, from the point of view of 
supporters cut down on the first in a nation incarceration rate, but critics, Mr. Wagesback, say that it, it's been a soft on crime approach which has led to our problem. Where are you? Would, would you walk back some of these sentencing uh, reforms? I think it's been a mixed bag. I think, let me tell you why. Some of, one of the sentencing laws in particular, right now there's a mandatory maximum of six months for some of these offenders. Some of these juvenile offenders I've spoken about, they know that they will get caught and released and six months is the max they will have. Well, drug court is an 18th month program. So what I'm hearing from district attorneys and sheriffs on the front lines, they say people they use to arrest who would opt for drug court and go in that 18-month period where they'd get clean and go back in society, they're saying no thanks because they know they're going to get out in six months and they'll be right back on the street dealing drugs. It is hurting our ability to retrain people. So some of those sentencing have to be, restrictions have to be revisited if we truly want to retrain people. Mr. Wilson. Well, I think our reform was a bipartisan effort, and it's one I think that we have to give an opportunity to work. Is any policy that we implement perfect? Absolutely not. But the reality is we have an issue with violent offenders, but that's not all that this uh, reform dealt with. We have to look at making sure that we are giving the policy an opportunity to work, to fully implement it, to recognize the savings and make the kinds of investments in the long term that are going to reduce uh, the incidences of crime across the state and improve the opportunities that we have to retain individuals to to train them properly and to make them tax paying citizens and not tax burdens for us. Investing in juvenile assessment centers, investing in reentry programs are all a part of that. And we have a history in this state of not giving new opportunities and new changes and new laws an opportunity to be successful. And that is absolutely what we have to do. We can clearly work around the edges, but we have to work collectively with local government, the entire justice community, as well as with the law enforcement community to make sure we're addressing the real problems and expecting realistic outcomes. All right, let's go to Jillian Corder. There's not a person watching this tonight who hasn't sat in traffic sometime, somewhere this week, and that includes our interstates and aging bridges like those in Lake Charles and Baton Rouge. Proposals to replace them still have not been approved. How do you plan to prioritize these and other vital road projects? It's me. Please. Well, thank you, Jillian. And, and listen, I'll, I'll respectfully disagree a little bit because for the first time in 30 plus years, we actually have made new investments that are hitting the budget this year. $150 million is coming to infrastructure. It's a result of a bipartisan effort that I'm honored to have been a part in. We also can go back and look at the half a billion dollars of projects over the last seven and a half years that I served as secretary to address these issues. It's important to recognize that we are building projects today that we talked about 30 years ago and we're doing it very efficiently efficiently, very effectively, and with an expedition or innovation that makes it work. So I understand that there's congestion. A lot of that speaks to growth. But you also have to realize that we've had a lot of congestion as a result of making changes and opening improvements. For example, the entrance to the airport, the Department of Transportation announced today that the flyover leaving from the airport is going to open uh, later this week. These are investments that should have been done a long time ago, and that's just one example. Look at the resources that we've amassed for infrastructure investments, and I think you'll be proud of where we're headed, not necessarily where we've been. And I can only be responsible for those seven and a half years, and I'm proud of the record that we have making a difference in this state. Mr. Wagesback. It's not a record anyone should be proud of. Look, Sean's a good guy, but the truth is the bureaucracy at DOTD has not been reined in. The Department of Transportation must be reduced and the dollars must be pushed out to the districts so you can make smart decisions down at the local level. Second, the legislature has some blood on their hands as well. Instead of prioritizing things like splash pads and all these neighborhood civic associations and things, they should be investing in high profile transportation projects that drive economic development and make families' lives easier whenever they're trying to commute to work and to school back and forth. And, so, and the third thing is that we know that in 2025, there's going to be a run to try to remove some of the dedication of vehicle registration fees to go to infrastructure. I will fight that removal. I will make sure those dollars stay committed to transportation projects because we need the resources, we need the priority, and we need the leadership to truly move the needle on these projects. All right. Um, let me give you an opportunity. You've got well, a bloated budget, Mr. Wackersberg says. Well, I, I would respectfully disagree because because the reality is that we have the lowest number of department employees in the history of the Department of Transportation and that we have continually operated at a budget that's operating at 50 percent or less than what it was actually designed to do. I deny the fact or reject the fact that the employees of our department aren't effective or weren't effective. 
When you go back and look at what they've done in terms of the disasters and the responses and the fact that we have grown our system and shrunk our department staff, that we haven't made the kinds of investments from the legislature to do the things that we're being asked to do uh, is just a fallacy that doesn't exist. When you go back and look at the legislature, look at how we earmarked projects and we funded things. I have championed doing the projects that we need to handle first. And I fully support maintaining the vehicle sales tax. We campaigned on it. We campaigned on investing in infrastructure in a way to grow an economy. I have a record of building jobs and very proud of that. Go look at the record of five and a half billion dollars over the last seven years. By far more money than we've ever seen and we did it with innovation and creativity and competitiveness on the national level. And, and, and then to, to Mr. Myers back, you were not the governor. Bobby Jindal was the governor, but you were a high-ranking person working for him. Correct. Uh, somebody might look at this and say, well, you know, Sean Wilson didn't invent DOTD. You know, if this was a priority why wasn't it addressed in the Jindal administration? Well, Sean Wilson worked in the Jindal administration for eight straight years, and he was the number two or number three person in the department at that same time. So the premise of that question is, look, during that time period, the first term where I worked there, there were a lot of talented people on a bipartisan basis who were hired to serve in that administration. I was proud to serve with all of them, proud to serve with Sean. I'm not trying to say it's all his fault, but to say that we have not done enough to reduce the bureaucracy of DOTD and push those dollars out to the people and to projects, yes, that is a firm belief I have. And as governor, I think it's my duty to look the taxpayers in the eye and say we're going to try to be better than we've ever had before, be more efficient than we ever have, and push dollars out to the people as much as we can, especially with inflation driving up the cost of transportation as much as it is. We owe it to taxpayers to be as efficient and as effective as we can, because we can't go ask them for more money right now whenever they are struggling to pay just their daily bills. And, and John, let me just say, during the Jindal years when I was at the Department of Transportation, we went through multiple right-sizing exercises, and we continued to perform and excel. What we never had the opportunity to do in the Jindal administration was make additional investments that we were able to do. We also integrated a permanent office to deal with right-sizing and organizational change and process improvement to always be more efficient. Go look at our competitive record. When I was Secretary of the Department of Transportation, we earned more competitive dollars on a national level than any other state in our nation. I am very proud of the fact that we brought innovation, we brought creativity to generate additional revenue that the legislature and the previous administration opted not to give us. We actually doubled the Port Priority Program on day one. We've made those multimodal investments and it's showing in the work that we're doing. All right. I'm, I'm, I'll move on unless you have something you want to add. I'm, I'm okay. fine to go okay. wherever you want to go. I'll have uh, Alina Noakes address the next question. First to you, Mr. Wagesbeck. In recent years, there have been calls to expand state-funded school choice. Proponents say expanding school choice will create competition and improve Louisiana's education system. But in central Louisiana, a few school districts are some of the most reliant on state funding and have the state's lowest paid teachers. Local educators fear they won't be able to compete with surrounding parishes that can compete. What's your position on this as a potential way to improve Louisiana's education system? You know, when I speak to parents across Louisiana, they, they're, they're worried that they're losing control over their child's future. And they just feel like they deserve it because they do deserve it. And so, yes, I do believe in empowering parents. And part of that is giving them control over the dollars the state is already going to spend on their behalf. Look, every year the state spends uh, several thousand dollars to educate a child. And right now, we tell those parents, if you're poor, what building to go to, what classroom to go to, and that's going to be the solution for you. I don't think that's right in the modern economy. I think we should allow all parents some choice there. Imagine if you have three ch children and one of them happens to be special needs and you want to move that child to a different school. If you have money, you can do it. If you don't have money, you're stuck. I don't think that's fair. So I think all parents deserve some flexibility, some authority to use the state dollars we are providing today in a way that best meets the needs of those families. I think that's pro-family, that's pro-education, and it's pro-Louisiana. Mr. Wilson. Thank you for that question, Elena. You know, I'm married to a 23-year educator, an assistant principal always in the public school system. I have a daughter who is actually a counselor in one of the most challenging public schools in Lafayette. I think we need to keep the focus on the children and the students that we have, and are we achieving the outcomes? And are we going to do things that are going to put those outcomes at risk? Everyone will tell you we are not fully funding education to the level that we should, whether it's early childhood education, K-12, 
or our universities. And we, we create opportunities to dwindle those resources and isolate them in different communities without the same level of accountability, without the same commitment to presenting the outcomes that our children need and deserve. We're doing more damage to the children that may not have those choices. And that's the fundamental system of why we have a public education, to ensure that there is a minimum standard that every child gets and that all of them can excel. And that's why it's important for us to invest in public education, to pay our teachers well, to invest in early childhood education. I've seen it. We've lived it. We made those personal investments for our children, ourselves, and for other people's children. And that's what we have to do in public education. All right, let's move on to our second round of questions. Um, and uh, Jillian Quarter has uh, a question for Mr. Wilson. In the wake of historic hurricanes, many homeowners have seen their insurance premiums double, while others have been left scrambling for a new insurer after companies have pulled from the state. An incentive program to attract companies to Louisiana has been called a Band-Aid solution by some. What must be done to create an equitable and sustainable insurance market? Well, Jillian, having been on the ground floor of every disaster during the time that I've been secretary, uh, working with families and people, I understand firsthand what it means to not have the ability to go back to your home or not to create the opportunity to put the pieces together. The $45 million bailout, I think, was absolutely necessary, but it is not sustainable, and it's unfair to the citizens who have paid those premiums. For us to bail out big insurance companies, I think, is the wrong answer when citizens have made these investments that we have. Clearly, we have to have a special session to address a number of issues, whether it's adjuster accountability, whether it's timelines and obligations of the insurance company, to make sure that we're treating our citizens fairly. No family should be putting at risk their future or taking care of their parents or raising their children as a result of an insurance company not addressing the issues that they should. This is a crisis that we have to address. We have to do it in a bipartisan way. And we have to bring competition back to our market so that our citizens aren't being held hostage by prices of big insurance companies. And that's a commitment I'm making as governor to lead that effort. Mr. Wagesback. The insurance market's a mess, and it's making it unaffordable to live in Louisiana. Families can't afford it. I'm committed to fixing it. I'm going to call a special session as soon as we get into office. I'm going to work with Commissioner Temple to put together that agenda. At a minimum, it has to, yes, have an incentive program to bring new insurers, provide regulatory flexibility so we can control some of those rates, authorize the insurance commissioner to push back on excessive rates, and force them to be reduced whenever there's savings to be had. We have to invest in fortifying communities, managing water better, fortifying the roofing program. But the last piece is the big one. We have to have legal reform if we truly want to reduce our rates. Right now, we know excessive lawsuits is one of our biggest problems. It drives away insurers, and it puts big paydays for just a select few of the billboard attorneys, and it comes out of your pocket as ratepayers. It's not fair. Now, look, it's hard for a person to say that because it brings a tax on me for doing it, but I'm not going to ever lie to you. The truth is we will never be able to reduce your rates unless we rein in the excessive lawsuits. And I promise you, I will do everything in my power to do that for you if I'm elected to your next governor. What about that, Mr. Wilson? Well, listen, we've, we've had let me Let me try to limit this to 30 seconds if I can. So in the state of Louisiana, there are a number of issues that we can deal with that affect this price, the prices that people are paying. Clearly, we know that the insurance companies are not in the best position or in the best interest of our citizens when they raise rates constantly, and we allow that to happen. That's unacceptable. And the argument of tort reform, we've seen several iterations of that that have not produced the results that citizens were promised, whether it's auto insurance or property insurance. There's a host of things that we've said under the name of tort reform that haven't delivered. I think we have to give citizens real results because that premium is going to come and citizens have to pay it and we need to do something about it. What a, why, in your opinion, will tort reform deliver? The, pro the problem with previous tort reform efforts is they weren't strong enough. We need to keep going back until we have found the savings for consumers that they deserve, and that's what we will do. The other piece I hear from consumers all across the state is the claims adjuster process. People are tired of the adjuster shuffle. They have a tragedy. They go to file a claim, and they have to repeat five, six, seven times to different adjusters. It delays claims. It holds their money. It's not right. We're going to train claims adjusters in our Louisiana University so that next time there's a storm, you don't have to wait for some stranger from Wisconsin to come down. We'll have a local neighbor coming in, processing your claim quickly so you can get your dollars fast. All right, let's go on to uh, Greg Merriweather. Gentlemen, as you know, much of our state's economy is tied to oil and gas. I think Chevron is one of the first oil companies to kind of look at newer energies. They've been, made a huge investment in the wind. What do you say to the folks out there um, whose livelihoods for generations have been tied to oil and gas? Where do you stand on these newer energies, and what, what, what's the message for those families? You know what I'd say to those families is help is on the way. 
The truth is, the tradition of Louisiana oil and gas and the Boudreaux's and Thibodeaux's and the people across this state who have produced it, it is a source of pride for this state, and it should be. We've done great work. The good news is the next generation of clean energy that America is going to produce, it will probably happen right here. The same companies who are drilling for oil and gas right now are the ones who are investing in the next generation of wind, the next generation of the turbines that are going to produce that new energy, the next generation of clean hydrogen, carbon capture, all of those same companies hiring all those same Louisianans to do the next generation of energy. So as long as we have a state that is proud of what we do today and has always leaned forward on what we're going to be proud to do tomorrow and continue to lean forward in research and development and be on that cutting edge, there will always be good jobs here in Louisiana because we are the energy center of the country. We're proud of it. We're proud of our past. We'll be even more proud of our future. Mr. Wilson. Well, Greg, I will tell you. The oil and gas industry put food on our table and clothes on my back as a kid. My dad worked in that business growing up. I think it's important to understand that the companies that are doing that type of exploration are also leading in the world of innovation to ensure that we're more resilient in what we do and that we're more responsible in terms of our natural resources and protecting them. And we're absolutely going to hire the same folks who are working in that oil and gas industry who may have transitioned to go get some other opportunities and other experiences. I don't see that going anywhere, but the fact that they are at the table and making the kinds of investment to be able to grow this industry, they're part of the solution. We cannot ignore the fact that they are going to be here and going to work with us. We have a climate action plan that's adopted in the state of Louisiana that's being led by many of those folks and are embraced, embraced by the environmental community. We have to be thoughtful, we have to be sustainable, and we have to be collaborative and work together. I'm supportive of that opportunity to get it right and hold individuals and companies accountable for making good investments that protect us and ensure that they're good neighbors to our families. You, you both seem to be suggesting, and perhaps you're right, but you both seem to be suggesting that we can replace these thousands of jobs on oil rigs and in the, in the oil industry upstream or downstream with the same number of jobs, roughly, in these new industries? Because some of them, there's a lot of construction jobs and then 50 jobs somewhere. Well, I think the market will always make that decision for us. Look, there's always going to be a next generation of technology. Look, AI is coming right around the corner. We have to figure out what impact that has on manufacturing down the road. So there are serious questions coming as technologies evolve, but the best way to have a strong, strong answer for those questions is to make sure that we're having a business climate that's worthy of investment, that we're producing a qualified workforce that's ready to be nimble and agile as markets evolve, and we go out and we attract those new companies around the globe and say, come here to Louisiana, because we have a strong tradition of serving the old energy of the past, and we have a strong interest in servicing the new energy of the future. Mr. Wilson. Innovation is what brought us here today, and the fact that you're not going to expect a complete transition overnight. You are at the precipice of oil and gas working and blending in with hydrogen and wind and solar and other elements, and we don't know what the next great thing is going to be. Hydrogen opportunities are out there. So will we have an opportunity to transition jobs and grow jobs in all of those spaces? Absolutely. Having an all-of-the-above energy approach is also also having an all of the above economy, having an all of the above workforce, and that is where we can go. And I think managing that transition and operate, operating efficiently and smartly is the way to go. Let's get a question from Alina Noakes. Juvenile offenders have confidentiality in Louisiana, but when juvenile offenders convicted of violent crimes escape from facilities, members of the public often aren't notified. The Office of Juvenile Justice says they cannot release the identity it, uh, of the offender to the media, but they can release it to local law enforcement. There have been cases all across the state where law enforcement has not released that information to the media despite their authority to do so. What changes need to be made to streamline the release of information and ensure public safety? Mr. Wilson. Clearly, for violent offenders, we have to hold them accountable and make sure that we're treating victims with respect and honoring the opportunity of justice. We have to be thoughtful in that process. As I'm, when I'm elected governor, we will clearly address this issue by making sure that there's transparency for victims and access to information. What we will not do is hold young people accountable before they're found guilty. I think that's one of the principles of justice that's unique to our country and is important to our system of justice for all ages. And so what we've seen our attorney general do was advocate for uh, issues to address juvenile offenders only if you lived in New Orleans, Baton Rouge, and Shreveport. And I just think that's patently unfair, unjust, and unconstitutional, and disrespectful of the entire state because it's saying that there are other parts of our state that might have uh, issues with juvenile offenders that we don't put an emphasis on. As governor, I'm going to address that issue of safety. Clearly, one of the things I've talked about in my campaign is making sure that we're safer first and being thoughtful and smart with justice uh, programs, whether they're reentry, juvenile assessment centers, and also addressing violent offenders and holding them accountable and disciplining them appropriately. 
Mr. Wag is back. Yeah, as governor, I'm going to make public safety the number one top priority in all of these discussions. We owe that to the people. If you come home at night and you're leaving your car to get to your front door and you're not sure you can get there safely, that is my duty to make sure you feel safe, and I will make that my top priority. So in a situation like this, if a juvenile offender is creating a, a threat of violence in your community, yes, I will inform you any way that I can to make sure you're prepared. Secondly, we do have to create facilities to bring these juvenile uh, uh, offenders that are safe from the public and retrained and detained there as well. The last thing I would say is law enforcement has said the, the splitting of DCFS, the Department of Child and Family Services, and the Office of Juvenile Justice has created um, miscommunication between the two. They're recommending that those be reunited once again so there's better tra uh, transparency, better communication. I want to explore that further to make sure that there's nothing slipping between the cracks because if something slips in, in between the cracks, that's your public safety at stake and I won't stand for it. All right, let's get a question from uh, Dominic Ben. In 2021, Louisiana was ranked 46th in health care, according to U.S. News and World Report. When mid-year budget cuts happen, so much of the state budget is off limits to cuts that critics have argued that an unfair burden falls on health care and universities. Some people have called for tearing up the state constitution. Where do you stand on that? I think it's me. It is. <laughs> um, I do think that our Constitution unfairly puts a bullseye on the back of higher education and health care, and I don't like it. So yes, I will try to go into that Constitution, provide some of that flexibility so there no longer has that bullseye, because we need to be investing in the health of our people and the education of our people, not trying to cut it. I don't like it when it's been done in the past. It won't happen in my administration. The other piece I would say is those poor health rankings are a stain on our people, on our taxpayers, and on our general health. We've got to find a way to to promote wellness, not just in our Medicaid and Medicare program, but also in our private insurance program. So I will look for ways to put incentives through that program so we can get that preventative wellness, those preventative health care checks that can turn a minor issue and stop it from becoming an emergency room issue. We, if we're ever going to move the needle on things like cancer, diabetes, obesity, um, hypertension, especially for pregnant women or women who just had babies, we have to do more to encourage them to do preventative wellness plans. I will do whatever I can and working with providers to put those incentives in our private and public insurance programs. Mr. Wilson. You know, I talk about in this campaign things that are going to make us safer, smarter, healthier, and wealthier. Three of those things are things the Constitution in the state of Louisiana does not protect, and it's always subject to budget cuts. It's in cuts, and it's been that way for several years. I'm the only candidate in this campaign that's committed to maintaining the Medicaid expansion from day one, with no qualifications, if, ands, or buts. I am going to do it, and I support it 100 percent. No other candidate has talked about that. If we're going to address those issues and address the health outcomes of our state, we've got to be thoughtful because these outcomes from a health perspective that keep us at the bottom of all of the rankings that we want to be at the top of have been around for generations and it's going to require a sustainable effort. I will commit to maintaining the Medicaid expansion but also protecting those resources not just for uh, seniors and elderly and children but for everyone from mental health to behavioral health to biological issues. We have to protect those things and I'm the only candidate that's really committed to doing it and will stand on that the entire time I'm your governor. John if I could. Um, sure. The truth is every credible candidate has said they would commit to keeping the Medicaid expansion. That's been, that's been said in all the debates. It's been reported by the newspaper. So that's not accurate. The other piece I said in actually previous debates that we have to also work with the providers to make sure we're putting the right incentives in those Medicaid expansion programs because we have to encourage those preventative wellness trips. When you go walk through some of the maternal units in this state and you talk to some of the doctors on the front line, they see a lot of women coming in Medicaid the first time they show up to have their baby is in an emergency room and they've never seen a doctor yet. We have to encourage them to come in. Doing it through the Medicaid expansion program is the right way to do I'll it. I'll give you a chance, Mr. Wilson, to have your say, but the, the part of the question was, would you support a constitutional convention, tearing up the Constitution and perhaps starting over? Well, let me just clarify my statement, because the idea that every candidate has supported it, they have, they have moved. I'm the only candidate from day one that said unequivocally that I was going to maintain Not the Medicaid accurate. expansion. The reality is the constitutional amendment is a very complex issue. And the way we've seen them structured, I don't know that we have the process in place that's going to protect the citizens of the state of Louisiana, because the fact that we have legislators and industry ho a stakeholders at the table and the lobbyists there, who's going to protect the citizens? And when you open up the Constitution to do that, you do create some uncertainty. Should we add some protections? Absolutely. But you have to have the administrative protections of a governor who's committed to those issues. But in the meantime, we were killing places like UNO. 
in in the in the budget in the bad budget years several years ago. Well, absolutely, we were doing that in the gentle years. The reality is, we've made more investments in higher education in these last seven years. When we went from paying 80 percent at the state up to almost down to 20 percent in the state, that became a problem. That affected our brain drain. That affected the ability of universities to go out and recruit faculty and students and to make the kinds of investments to grow our economy. We have to have a stable funding opportunity for all of them, and I am committed to doing that. I'm the only candidate who has experienced all of these levels at other areas, in other areas of higher education, having been a board member of the University of Louisiana system. So absolutely, we're going to protect higher education. I'll give you the final word, Mr. Wagersback, if you want it. Every candidate, and from the beginning, I have said that I would keep the Medicaid expansion. And even Jeff Landry, who's invited tonight, who will pretend is standing right here because he's not really here. Even he has said from the very beginning he would keep that. So he's not the only candidate saying that. And look, those cuts to higher ed back then during the Great Recession, they were wrong then. They're wrong now. They'll be wrong in the future. The only way to make sure they don't happen again is to have a growing economy, that those cuts aren't needed, and we remove those restrictions in the Constitution so we never have to revisit that again. All right, let's get a question from Greg Merriweather as we start round three. Uh, gentlemen, uh, could you please just uh, spell out your position on abortion? That's obviously a, a big topic here in Louisiana now with the new laws going into effect. Should there be any exceptions? Where do you stand on this? Mr. Wilson. Listen, I'm married to my wife of 28 years. I have a daughter who has a daughter, and I trust their decisions. I trust their decisions to protect themselves, and I do not think it is the governor's place or the legislature's place to make the decisions for a woman when we have doctors trained to do this. My wife and I make decisions for us, and we've always stood by that. Our faith, our own personal experiences, and our lifestyle manages that for us and directs us for that. It's not my place to make every one of those decisions that are very complicated for women, and I will stand and always protect women and their ability to make the decisions that are for them. Those are the realities of my life, and that was every citizen deserves. I'm also a candidate that believes we should begin by having exceptions, not just for the life of the mother, but rape and incest, and there are other medical issues that may be extreme situations that doctors know best. And I'm going to trust the doctors to make those decisions, and I'm going to trust the patients of those doctors to be in counsel with them and to do the decisions that are necessary for them. Mr. Wagersback. Yeah, this is a deeply emotional and personal issue for many in this state. Look, I am a pro-life candidate, and I support the current law and the current uh, provisions in, in, in law today. Look, my, my pro-life status comes for two reasons. One, my faith. It, it, is a, it is a pact that I made with my God. The second piece is because of my personal life experience. My wife and I are proud to be the parents of three boys. Um, the pregnancy for our middle son was extremely challenging for my wife. And we were advised early on in that pregnancy that to avoid some severe ramifications, we should consider termination. We didn't blank. We chose no. We went forward with it. And to this day, that young man is a blessing not just to me, my wife, my other two sons, but to everyone he touches, his life is special. His life is making a difference. And I think every life deserves that chance. Now, those that perpetrate heinous crimes like rape and incest, I will throw the book at them and make sure they are punished. And every woman that goes through pregnancy, I'm going to make sure that we are doing everything we can to make sure we are there for them, not just during the pregnancy, but after the pregnancy. That is our government's duty, and that is what I will do as governor. All right, let's go on to uh, Jillian Cordes and another question. Louisiana is one of the few southern states losing population. Census numbers show that from 2020 to 2022, the population shrank by 1.6 percent. Why do you believe people are leaving? Mr. Wagesback. The brain drain is killing us. It's absolutely killing us. We are losing our people every single year, and this is our wake-up moment. If we continue to losing our best and brightest to other states, where will we be five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road? We'll be losing another congressional seat. More importantly, we'll be losing our way of life. Look, young people leave for a job, but when they get to Texas or other states, they fall in love with the quality of life. In the post-COVID era, every employee realizes they can move all over the country and chase jobs and chase communities and work virtually. They are going to be on the move if you can't provide a good job a safe community, a good education system, and an enjoyable quality of life. We've got work to do to compete in the modern economy. The good news is the South is booming. People are moving South right now. If we can get our house in order, we can create that growing economy, create that solid school system, make our community safe. We, not only can we keep our best and brightest here, we can attract those moving South from other states, and we can start growing again, something we haven't, had, we haven't seen in the last decade. Mr. Wilson. Well, John, I will tell you, we've seen people leave Louisiana. We talked about the brain drain back in 2004, and we haven't done anything about it. 
I understand as I've traveled the 45,000 miles and spoken to college students all across the state, urban and rural, they're leaving for wages. They are burdened with the high cost of higher education or vocational education. They're burdened with student debt and they're burdened with the fact that they can't get the types of jobs here because we haven't created the wage environment that they can be successful. No one can compete with this state in terms of culture and entertainment, food, fishing, and fun. The reality is they're going to other places and they're getting their start. We have to start making investments in education to help them create their own businesses, to build a workforce, but it also starts with these basic elements that every family wants. They want to be safe in their communities. They want to have an educational system where they can raise their children and not have to send them to private school necessarily or live in a gated community because of the increased cost of living. They want a place where we have a healthy environment and we're making the right kinds of decisions decisions for them and for our state. That's what it's going to take and that's how you get people to come back to Louisiana and never make a decision to leave. All right, let's get a question now from uh, Lena Noakes and we'll go first to uh, Mr. Wagesback. I forget. <laughs> The state's almost half cent sales tax is set to roll off in the next few years, resulting in the loss of hundreds of millions in revenue. What is your plan to combat the loss of revenue and ensure Louisiana does not have a budget shortfall? You know, several years ago, the legislature went in and raised a lot of taxes. And since then, they've had huge surpluses every single year. And so the good news is, is that since they've raised taxes, they've had surpluses lying all over the capital. So I do think there's some efficiencies to be had there. The second piece is in 2025, we know there's a temporary tax that will be rolling off. It's about $400 million. The best way to prepare for that is to elect a governor who is focused on job creation and growing the economy. Because as we grow the economy, that will make us, make us less dependent on those temporary taxes staying permanent. That's what I've done throughout my adult career. Go on and listen to job creators, examine markets, and figure out how we can grow and expand our economy. That's what I want to do for Louisiana. You have to have a job creating governor, someone who understands economic development in the office, so that when 2025 comes around, we won't need that temporary tax any longer. Because I do want that to roll off, because with inflation, driving up costs for all families in this state, giving them tax relief is one of the few things that we can do to make their lives a little bit easier. Mr. Wilson. Now's the time that we should be investing in Louisiana. Several folks of this campaign are talking about the things they will do to make us safer, smarter, and healthier, but no one's talking about how you pay for that. That's voodoo economics. You have to be able to fund these priorities. I think it's important for us to take those resources and not make decisions based on a budget that has disaster re relief money, that has hurricane response money, that has COVID money, and assume that this budget is bloated. We've made decisions that are good for our tax system to lower the tax burden on citizens as states do well. But we have historically gone from peak economies to valley economies, and we've seen what it's like to have the deficits. And we just talked about when we have those deficits, we cut education. We cut health care. We cut public safety. We can't have it both ways. We absolutely should take this point four five and make investments that are going to address the type of outcomes and the infrastructure development that we need in the state to support the economy. Waiting for jobs to come and building them over time, we should do that. But it's not going to address the immediacy of the problem in terms of this budget and what we should be managing. Uh, I, I want to follow up on this because I think there's a little philosophical separation here. That half penny comes off the books under a Governor Wagesback. Correct. And, I mean, what do you, what do, you do to, you know, do you get right back into where we were a few years ago with, with constant budget issues? No, if you remember that first it was the full penny that was needed to be raised, then it became the half penny, and then it became the .45 penny, and now since they've gone to the .45 penny, there have been huge surpluses every single year. This year they didn't even know what to spend all the money on. There were so, so many surpluses in the legislature. All the while that's happening, all the while you've got this monopoly money all over the capital, people in the real world are struggling. The cost of a gallon of milk, the cost of insurance, the cost of bacon, the cost of anything you want to provide for your kid's school is getting outrageous. So how can we look the taxpayers in the eye and say, hey, sorry, you're going to have to fund government a little bit more, especially when we know national economists are predicting a recession in the next year and a half. I can't look the Louisiana taxpayer in the eye and tell them just to tough it up and pay more to state government. What, what about that, Mr. Wilson? I mean, people are struggling. They're, they're struggling with the, the, the trip to the grocery store, the trip a to the gas pump. Absolutely, people are struggling. We see it every day ever as I've traveled the state. The reality, John, is 
it's going to cost us to be able to protect our citizens and make the kinds of investments. And when you look at the budget, it's not all coming from sales tax. It's coming from a multitude of taxes, whether they're corp corporate taxes, personal income taxes. And so when you create this gap, no one is going to tell you how to fill it. No one's going to tell you how do you keep the hospitals open that you're going to have to take grandmother to. No one's going to tell you how do you pay teachers and do the things that we've done. We've got resources to make an investment. That is what businesses do. They don't necessarily give money back. They make investments in their businesses. And we should be making investments in government. And so I think we should keep that money. Now, whether or not you keep 0.45, because we have demonstrated some fiscal responsibility to draw that down, but we also have to be thoughtful about addressing the needs that we have here in the state of Louisiana. Let's go to a question from Dominic Ben. The town of Faraday has experienced at least two water boil advisories and water pump failures within the past month. And even in North Louisiana and Red River Parish, many of the homeowners there were suggested to drink bottled water instead of use their water. Additional towns face similar issues all over the state. How do you plan to ensure that every Louisianan has safe drinking water? Mr. Wilson. Well, we have made tremendous investments as of late in terms of this budget year to make investments in public works. The legislature did a great job, I believe, in working with local governments, particularly those that are struggling, to be able to make those types of improvements to ensure their systems are sustainable and can address those issues, not just in rural communities. We've worked over the course of my term as secretary to make better investments in public infrastructure. We have to continue to make those investments. We have to support rural economies and local governments to go after federal resources that are there. We need to develop the Office of Planning to ensure that we can support them, not just in applying for the grants, but actually implementing them to make the necessary investments, whether they're watershed initiatives, broadband initiatives. There's a lot of opportunity right before us in Louisiana. We're going to spend billions of dollars over the next several years rebuilding this state, and we need to have someone as governor who understands what it's like to get it, to get it done and to be rubber meets the road to really build this state up so that we can sustain it to ensure that we have clean water, clean air, and great resources in our community. Communities. This is a sad and tragic byproduct of a shrinking state economy and a shrinking state population. If we were in Texas, do you know why they don't have drinking water problems? Because they have growing economies, they have growing tax bases, they have growing markets where there's dollars available to make those types of investments. We have to focus on becoming a state that people want to move into and want to invest in. We will never have enough state money from the magic money tree inside the capital to do all of this. We have to grow, we have to expand, we have to be a welcoming environment, not just for the people who are born and raised here, but for those looking to move south and invest. That's why having a pro-jobs, pro-economic development governor is so good for so many different reasons. Now also, we know the state uses its capital outlay program to make investments in, in opportunities like this. We must prioritize those communities that deserve safety. Safety comes in drinking water, safety comes in law enforcement and, and, and uh, paying police officers and cameras. So we will prioritize safety and infrastructure in our capital outlay program every chance we get. Well, John, this is a great example of making the kinds of investments that we need to make. Houston alone has almost three times as many people as the state of Louisiana, and you can't create rural jobs if you don't have clean water, if you don't have clean air, if you don't have infrastructure. This is an opportunity to take dollars to make the kinds of public investments that we need to ensure that we can attract those jobs for manufacturing and other small businesses in rural communities. This is an example of thinking that it's going to happen just by creating jobs. These small communities are losing people and they can't sustain the type of maintenance that's necessary and the improvements that are necessary because they've lost the tax You've got to start somewhere, and making investments in public infrastructure is absolutely essential. I'm glad he brought up Houston, because Houston did not grow because of big taxes and big government. You know, 100 years ago, we had about just under 3 million people less than Texas. You know, 100 years ago, we had 1 million people more than Florida. Back then, during that time, those states decided to invest in local communities and have local communities and local counties drive that state's success. We made a decision to make the state capital and big government be the solution to all problems. We've learned over the last 100 years, it's a broken system. So we have to start learning from Houston. The secret of Houston and Texas is, they trust locals, they trust growing economies, they trust growing expanded tax bases to solve a lot of those problems. We've got to start getting in that direction soon. Let's go on to a question from Alina Noakes, uh, and we'll have this uh, first to Mr. Wagesbeck. 
The state's redistricting case remains in court. Next week, Louisiana's congressional map is in the federal appeals court in New Orleans to determine how it moves forward. In light of the Supreme Court's ruling for Alabama to redraw their map to include another minority majority district, a state with even less of a black population than Louisiana, what is your position on Louisiana's map challenge? You know, my position as governor is we will follow the law. The truth is we have six congressional members right now, and they're all good people, and we work closely with all of them on a bipartisan basis, and we will going forward. The courts are currently deciding whether the current lines we have need to be changed or altered, and whatever the final decision of the court is, as governor, I will make sure that we adhere to that law once it's finally decided by the court. That is my role. That is my job. You know, it's d difficult this year because in previous, a decade ago when we did this last time, there was something called pre-clearance. You could talk to the feds in advance and ask them, hey, does this look right? Is is this going to meet muster? They'd give you a little prelim sign-off so you knew you were heading in the right direction. Well, preclearance is no longer an option for states. So many states had to go in and draw some of these lines for the first time without that preclearance opportunity. So several states are in this situation where they're depending on the courts to give them guidance. So we and other states, it's our duty to adhere to the law once it's finalized. Mr. Wilson. The Supreme Court has opined that it was unconstitutional in Alabama, and Louisiana falls squarely in that opinion, I believe. And it's my hope and belief that the judge makes the decision. Let's go back in history and understand that we communicated that to the legislature. The judge expressed an opinion of what that was, was going to be, and the legislature rejected that. They decided to do what they wanted to do because it was politically expedient as opposed to seeking justice and fairness for the citizens of Louisiana. It's my hope that the judge mandates that district and that it gets in effect as soon as possible to ensure that Louisiana has representation that is reflective of the state that we all live in and will work in Washington do what's good for Louisiana and what's best. That is what leadership has to do is invest in the state but also do it fairly and constitutionally and follow the law. I agree that we follow the law. I will always do that, and I will support the legislature in doing those things and encourage them to stay the course when they're deviating for political purposes. Forgive me. I thought you were wrapping up there. My bad. That's okay, John. Uh, 30 seconds. I mean, it would have been better, wouldn't it, if, if the legislature had written this map rather than perhaps it seems relying on a a special master in a court? Well, the legislature had an opportunity to do that, and they opted to act in a political way as opposed to following data. And that's why citizens lose confidence in government. That's why they question the political process. And we see those shenanigans happen over and over again, whether it's budget, whether it's drawing maps, whether it's policy around health care or education. We play games with people's lives, and that's unacceptable. And the judiciary is set in place to do just that. And I want to thank the judges at the Supreme Court for making a decision that is right for a change. That is an important thing for them to do, and they've made those decisions, not just here, but in other states. And the numerics are there that we should have a second congressional district. Mr. Wagersbach. I think the legislature, we don't know yet what their final role will be in this whole process because there hasn't been a final ruling by the court system. That final ruling could say, legislature, go back and draw a map with these parameters, or the final ruling could say, this is your new map, take it or leave it. We don't know that yet because we haven't seen that final. Look, due process was created a long time ago by our founding fathers and it needs to be followed in all cases, including this one. The end product, though, I think will be a legal, statutory legal, constitutional legal map that our citizens will be proud to live underneath and will be, help us have our representatives in Congress. We are at about a minute and a half before we go to closing remarks. So let me limit you to 30 seconds on, on a couple other kind of things we'll wrap up with. Legalization of recreational marijuana. If that, where would you stand on that? Listen, I think we should decriminalize it. I don't think that it's ready or that Louisiana is ready for the legalization of that. We have some major safety jobs in our state, and that will have an effect because of federal laws. Clearly, you have to start somewhere, and I think we decriminalize it to look at what we have in our criminal justice system and what we're seeing in our communities, and then study that issue to make the determination finally what needs to happen. Mr. Wagensbeck. I do not think legalization of recreational marijuana is the right decision for this state, but we do have a, medicine, excuse me, a medicinal marijuana program right now. And look, as a special needs father, I know there are a lot of people I talk to in that community who have used some version of medicinal marijuana to really see improved outcomes from their children. I think that's a great opportunity for those families. 15 seconds on this one, gentlemen. Um, handheld devices while driving a vehicle, if they were outlawed uh, under a bill, would you sign it? Handheld, I, I want to make sure you understand. In other words, driving with a, a handheld device. Uh, no, 
that I don't know. I have to read the bill. That feels like a little bit like a nanny state to me. But I do worry about distracted driving. It's a huge issue in the state. So I do want to crack down on it. But a straight up ban. I'd have to look at the language on that. And one. Mr. Wilson. For seven years as Secretary of Transportation, I championed safety, and I've been to too many uh, accidents and fatalities. We killed 900 plus people. That's almost three people per day in the state of Louisiana. I would absolutely support a bill that's going to make our people safer. All right, gentlemen, it's time for closing remarks. By luck of the draw, Mr. Wagusback goes first. Lucky me. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here tonight. Look, it's down to crunch time. We're less than three weeks left before you will decide who your next governor is. So I'm going to give you my opinion. Sean is a very nice person. He's a friend of mine. I'd be honored to have him as my neighbor. But if you are a Democrat and you vote for Sean to go into the runoff, you're basically voting for Jeff Landry because I don't think he can beat Jeff. If you're a Republican, I would urge you to also vote for me on October 14th because you have been robbed from the debate you truly want, a debate of me versus Jeff Landry on this stage to talk about the issues important to Louisiana. I want to give it to you. He doesn't want to show up and give it to you. So I would urge Republicans, you should vote for me to October 14th to get that debate in the runoff. And independence. You're looking for someone who's fair, open, reasonable, wants to depend on you to control this state's future. That's who I am. That's how I make leadership decisions. So whether you're a Democrat or a Republican or an independent, I think I'm the best option for you to consider. Early voting starts this Saturday. Game day is October 14th. Please go to wagsforla.com. Give me your look. I would love to earn your vote and your support. And Mr. Wilson. I'm Sean Wilson. I've worked for Republicans and Democrats for the last 25 years, putting the people of Louisiana first. I will always act in a way to make you safer, smarter, healthier, and wealthier. And this race is about the future of Louisiana, but let's face it, this race is also about race. The idea that we will not elect an African-American governor is unacceptable to me. The people of Louisiana are far better than that. I am tired of those types of decisions and reputations of this state. It's time that we give the opportunity for leadership that's proven, that's prepared, that is successful in what they've done, the chance to lead the state of Louisiana. It's been 150 years. I understand that. But this race is about the future of Louisiana, and it's bigger than just policy when it comes to people saying that Sean cannot win. As a Democrat, as a person of color, as a native of New Orleans, as a proud husband and father, I am the candidate to best lead Louisiana. Go visit us at WilsonForLA.com. Understand the record. Compare us. I'm the candidate that's going to make sure you're safer, smarter, healthier, and wealthier. Republicans, independents, or Democrats. Vote number 16. All right, gentlemen, thank you both for joining us this evening. We do want to thank UNO for their hospitality and hosting us. Early voting does start this Saturday and runs until October 7th, uh, not on Sunday, just so you know. Election day or game day, whatever you call it, is in fact October 14th. On behalf of the panel, Dominic Ben, Greg Merriweather, Jillian Corder, and Alina Hope Noakes, I'm John Snell. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, and good night. Thank you for watching the 2023 Race for Governor debate live from the 